especially a good group from Lamberth. Welcome, guys. Uh, we're glad that you are here. Uh, we're excited about this evening as we have Dr. Michael Cogdell coming uh, to share with us about calling, hearing, and responding to God's call. And I think we're going to be blessed this evening, but I want to begin with prayer. Would you join me in, in prayer? Father, you are our good and great God. Lord, we love you and we stand amazed at your love for us. You create us, breathe life into us. It is in you that we live and move and have our very being. We are grateful for this day, for the time of worship that we enjoyed this morning, and now for the opportunity to be in your house this evening to listen to Dr. Cogdell and what you have shared with him to share with us on this special uh, lecture. And Father, we are so grateful that you love us enough that through your grace, you call us to join you in the work that you are doing. So I pray as we gather in this place this evening that our ears would be open and our hearts receptive uh, to what we will hear tonight, that we would be encouraged, Lord, to listen for your call. Lord, that we would have a heart to respond in obedience to you in all that you call us to. We lift Dr. Cogdell to you, pray your blessings upon him. Thank you for the wisdom that you have given to him. And Lord, we just pray that all that takes place this evening would bring honor and glory to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, our Garrett lecture began several years ago, it was almost five years ago now, when some of Herman and Mary Elizabeth Garrett's family came to see me and they wanted to honor their parents and help memorialize them as well. And so they established some funds to be used for a, a lecture each year that would help the church. And uh, it's been great. This is our third lecture. And Dr. Caldwell, we are so grateful that you have set aside this time to be with us. Uh, Mike has written a book. You may have seen it. It depends on how you entered the sanctuary. Uh, but you may have gone by that table. If not, after our time here, you can do that. It's in the solarium area. He has a book. It's worth a life, hearing and responding to God's call. Uh, the cost is $15, and he'll be happy to sign that for you uh, if you would like to purchase a book at the end of the lecture uh, that we have tonight. But we are grateful to the Garrett family for providing uh, this time for us this evening and for Mike coming. Um, he has done so much. You can read a little bit of his biography in the bulletin that you received. I'm not going to go through all his awards and recognitions that he's received, but I'd like to just speak personally. Uh, I, I've known Dr. Cogdell by reputation pretty much the whole time I have been in North Carolina, but I did not meet him until I was coming to be your pastor, and he was interim of this church, uh, 1998 to 1999, for 20 months. And uh, I've been able to stay here for almost 19 years. July will be 19 years. And Mike, I give you a lot of credit for that. You did a great job uh, preparing the way, and I just appreciate the good work uh, that Mike did here. I appreciate the fact that he was the founding dean of Campbell Divinity School, and it's a great school. It's doing great work preparing uh, ministers for churches just like ours. And um, it's just been a joy for me to be able to be on the campus of Campbell at least two or three times a year to see the work that is taking place there. And um, I'm excited about Campbell Divinity School and its future. I like the way it was founded. Christ-centered, Bible-based, ministry focused. That's true of the Divinity School and that's certainly true of its founding dean, uh, Mike Cogdell. And as he shares with you, um, you're gonna see that. He is married to Gail, many of you remember her and they have uh, 
two children and three grandchildren. Is that right? Four now. Okay, four. So uh, the tribe is increasing. Mike, we're glad that you're here. Would you make him welcome as he comes and shares with us? Thanks, Steve. I think he's already noticed that at the conclusion of his lecture, we're going to have a little dialogue time down here, and that's when he'll really be on the hot seat. But we're glad that you're here. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, Pastor, for your kind words and greetings to all of you. Uh, it's wonderful to be in Roxborough Baptist Church uh, tonight and to remember the good days uh, and the people that I met and shared with during my time as interim. I actually started to sit down in that chair right there. I remember coming up the steps and the choir always lining up in the hallway out there, and I understand that they still do that. But thank you. Thank you so very much for this wonderful invitation uh, to be here tonight and to talk with you about this great topic, uh, hearing and responding to God's call. Uh, it's been my privilege to serve as interim pastor in a number of churches, but none that I hold any dearer uh, than Roxborough Baptist Church. And I thank you so much for this invitation to be back and this invitation to share, share with you this evening. My friend Sarah Childers is here uh, in this audience. It's a great interim because of the people. Second, she did all the work, and all I had to do was preach on Sunday mornings, and that was a wonderful, wonderful time uh, for me. But thank you for this invitation and for your pastor's kind words and opportunity to be with you tonight. I want to think with you a little while tonight about this great topic, hearing and responding to God's call. The God who has revealed himself in Scripture to us all is a God who calls. God calls. Call is a distinctive feature of of God's character. It's part of his makeup. It's part of his desire for humanity in the world. God calls men and women to share with him in the divine work that he has given to us in the world. The Gospel of John expresses this very well. When we're reminded in the Gospel that God is the caller, we are the called. And every one of us has been called. As your sheet will show you tonight, the highest calling anyone can ever receive is to be called to be a Christian. That's the highest calling that any of us ever receive. God's call comes to likely and unlikely people. You know stories about that. God's call comes to likely candidates and unlikely candidates. God's call always comes in a context. It comes in the real world, and it comes in the midst of life. Context is a big factor in calling. Timing is a big factor in calling. Pastors deal with that all the time, and I know that you do. You may, be, you may feel called to a new place, a new responsibility, a new vocation. Is the timing right is a question that you might ask. But answering God's call and following God's call also brings a wonderful dimension to life. That is that sometimes we live a life that we never could have imagined. And it, it happens because we have said yes to God's call. And people who answer God's call, more frequently than not, will say, I never could have imagined that God would open all these doors and that God would make this kind of life available to me. As we're going to see tonight, God does call to ordained ministries, but God's call is not limited to ordained ministries. It is not limited to those ministries requiring ordination. God calls to other vocations. The word vocare, the root word of the word vocation means to call. 
Our vocation can be our calling. Call does not always equal the role that we play. You can be called to be a Christian, but you change roles. Pastor to teacher or to youth minister to pastor or whatever. It doesn't always mean that. And call is not always the same as profession. Profession is the way we make our living. If our calling can be our vocation, all the more wonderful. You may remember Paul was called to be the great apostle to the Gentiles. But the way he made his living was by being a tent maker. And you may recall that he had to suspend his ministry a time or two and go back and work at his profession to save up money to continue with his calling. That's just how great calling is. Now, I want you to consider an opening example tonight, and then we can refer to others. And I know you've been studying call some on Wednesday nights or in other settings in the church. The Old Testament is the life story of Israel. The Bible begins with the story of the creation of the world, the creation of man and woman, and then the, the call of Abram, whose name would later become Abraham. We know him as the father of Israel. Sometimes we even go to lengths to talk about the book of Genesis being divided so neatly, Genesis 1 through 11, the creation stories, and 12 through 50, the story of the patriarchs. But if you really study context, Abram's story begins back in chapter 11 uh, when the report is made that Abram and his wife Sarah at the time were struggling with a very difficult problem of barrenness. Barrenness is a very difficult problem, and it's hard on couples who go through that particular dilemma. And you remember that Abraham and Sarai could not have children. And we're told that in chapter 11. And wouldn't you know it, when they're dealing with a problem, a big problem in their marriage life, God calls. Call always comes in a context. And God would say to Abraham, I am going to make you father. Father? Father? Abram, I'm going to make you a father, a father of many nations, and your descendants will be more numerous than the sands upon the sea. Don't miss that part of the story of the call of Abram. Name changed later to Abraham. Sarai's name changed later to Sarah. And you remember how all of that promise was fulfilled both in their married life and in their descendants. So we see some beginning elements of God's call that I want you to see tonight. Call never occurs in a vacuum. It occurs in a context, and the context is real. Sometimes God calls when there are hard times. If you study the call of Samuel, which I've heard that you have, the preface to that whole call experience is the word of the Lord was rare in those days. And isn't it just like God to call a person in a time like that? So God's call. God's call comes to all. Sometimes it's ordained ministry, not ordained ministries. Sometimes it connects with vocation. Uh, it comes in good times and hard times but always in an historical context. So let's look at a few great dimensions of God's call. God's call is not something that is our work. God is the caller, and I want us to know that tonight. Hearing and responding to God's call bestows an honor uh, unequaled upon men and women. Those of you who have a great sense of call, can you believe that the one who is the maker of heaven and earth called you? God's call is very personal. What a blessing to be called by God. 
here is something that I bet a lot of you will identify with. Many times, the hand of God is shaping a person long before, long before they know what that experience means. We're going to talk more about that a little bit later. When we come to talk about converse, uh, confirmation of call, something we Baptists have gotten a little bit away from, and I hope to plant a seed with you to recover. But I bet it's true of a lot of you who've answered God's call that the seeds of that call had been in, a, in your life for a long time been in your long-term memory, been in your heart. And sometimes that happens long before we realize what it is. Now, other people will say, I've seen it. We're going to talk about that. And you want to say to them, well, why didn't you tell me? And sometimes that does happen. So I bet there's a lot of you who can identify with this tonight. Uh, your calling, your vocation. It might have been building. It might have been in your long-term memory. It might have been uh, a part of your life for a long time before you ever realized it. And I think that's very important. So I want you to hold on to that one for a few minutes. Quickly, I want to share with you some different ways that God calls. God calls in a lot of different ways, doesn't he? Certainly one of them uh, is by sudden experiences, like Paul on the Damascus Road. The truth is, the truth is that not, not a lot of people are called that way. Uh, call tends to be more gradual. It, te it tends to be something that develops in our lives uh, for a long time. But some people do report very sudden, very dramatic types of, of revelations that come. And certainly God calls that way. And we have some of those great stories in the Bible. Sometimes God calls just by reasoned decisions. God has given us a good mind. And he expects us to use it. Sometimes God lays out his desires and points to needs for us. And he expects us to respond to it. Now, a great illustration of this is a discussion about gifts and talents. So let me plant this seed with you. Uh, we don't have time to go into all of that, but what are your talents? What talents has God given you? If you have a talent, in my judgment, you have a responsibility to that talent. If that talent is music, Zach, or if that talent is children, or if that talent is missions, or if that talent is teaching, or if it is preaching or serving, whatever that talent is, I believe that we all have a responsibility to that talent. So I want you to think about that one for a few minutes as well. Now that often involves just reasoned decisions. Reasoned decisions that we think about and respond to. Here is one I alluded to, and that is the prompting of others. Has it ever happened in Roxborough Baptist Church? Ever happened to you? Someone comes forward. And they announce that they've been called to the ministry. And your pastor asked that person to stand here and ask all of you to come by and offer the right hand of fellowship and words of encouragement. And it's not uncommon, uncommon for some of you to come by or somebody to come by and say, I've known this about you a long time. And you just want to say, well, why didn't you tell me? confirmation from others. Now, here's where we've gotten away from this a little bit in Baptist churches. Used to be when we gave the invitation, we invited people to come to know Jesus. We invited people to join the church. 
invited rededication of life, and we always said a fourth one. Does anyone here need to answer a call from God today? We've gotten away from that. But you know what else we've gotten away from? The belief that call is so individualistic. Calling is communal. Calling happens with the body of Christ. It's not private. It can be private in the sense of one person marking it out. But calling belongs to the body. So adults here tonight, have you looked around this church lately at the young people here? And have any of you thought that person right there would make a great youth minister? That person right over there would make a fine minister. That person would make a wonderful missionary. And have you ever put your hands on those people and say, Sally, have you ever thought about this? Have you ever considered that? We've become so individualistic in society and everybody's privacy, that we've lost a little bit of the communal nature of calling. And so it belongs to the body. And I hope you will recover some of that and think about these people and people in your church, the prompting of others, the prompting of others, and it can mean a lot. Another one is that God just shows a need. God sometimes doesn't do it dramatically. He just points a need, and he expects us to respond, and you know that. What I wanted to mention to you tonight about calling is a new epistemology. The word epistemology means knowing. How do we know? And the one that is talked about more than any other right now in these days is knowing by doing. Knowing you're called by doing. How many of you have been on a mission trip here? Mission trips work, don't they? They're wonderful. I love mission trips. Sometimes when you take people on a mission trip, they discover their calling. This is where I am supposed to be. We see it all the time in Divinity School when we have students who are who are uh, doing CPE or serving chaplain positions or serving in supervised ministry and they get the chance to work in churches and they come back and say, I am most at home when I'm in the hospital. I am most at home when I'm leading our youth group. I am most at home when I'm working in missions, knowing by doing and it's a wonderful way to discover your calling now I never heard that much when I was younger but today there is just a new way to think about calling and it's knowing by doing and you work in internships you work in a church you volunteer for this place or that place you go on a mission trip and what happens is you discover your calling. So I want to lift up tonight something we might talk about later, the idea of knowing by doing. So the different ways God calls. These are are not all the ways. God's call is mysterious and wonderful and works in our hearts. Now, what I want to show you tonight are some general truths about God's call. Now, I want to emphasize general, and I'm glad there's some young people here because I really want them uh, to to think about these things that I'm I'm putting, uh, we'll put on the screen for you. I say general because they can work in different ways. Uh, God's call comes in different ways. But here are some things that are generally present, are generally present when a call experience is happening. And here's the first one. And this applies to us all now. Usually, there is a general sense of restlessness in a person's spirit. A general sense of restlessness 
in a person's spirit, especially with their present situation. Uh, a call from God uh, is personal, but not necessarily private or secretive. Have any of you ever heard this? I've been working in insurance now for 10 years. And I'm just not in the right place. I've been working in this profession now for so many years or so many months. And I'm just not happy there. Whenever I hear words like that, I know what the person is saying. But many times, that, those words are music to my ears because I think a call may be going on. A general characteristic, now I emphasize general, is that there is a sense of restlessness that's usually within a person's spirit. Some of you know what it's like to have someone come to you and they'll say, when I was a kid or when I was younger, I felt God calling me. I felt God calling me to the ministry. I felt God calling me to this, but I didn't act on it. I, I just didn't do anything about it at the time. And then the question that follows is, is it too late? Is it too late to follow God's call? No, it's not. It's never too late to follow God's call. A general sense of restlessness. Now, that's happened with people in this room. Sometimes uh, it's trial and error, isn't it, getting to the places that God has called us. Many people find great joy in a second profession or a second work. But sometimes people get to midlife and there's just a real restlessness. Just a real restlessness. And many times it can be traced back to not answering a call or just being unhappy. And so the, you know the questions that come. I, what is God calling me to do now? What do I need to do with the second half of my life? The second half of my life. Sometimes a real sign of God's call is a general sense of restlessness within a person. So if you ever hear that, if you ever hear that, probe it a little bit. And it, sometimes it can mean that a call experience is happening. So I want you to remember that, this sense of restlessness. Here's another one, and it's a big one. Most of the time when we're dealing with call, the sense of restlessness might be present, but something else might be present. And that is a tug of the heart. I don't know a fancier way to say that. It's a tug of the heart. Young people here tonight, what tugs at your heart? What, what's, what in the world, what's in the world? What need is in the world? that is tugging at your heart. And adults here tonight, what, what tugs at your heart? Be interested to hear what some of you would say about that. Many times when a person is dealing with a call, there's this sense of restlessness and there's this sense of, of something tugging at your heart. I found that true as a college student. I was majoring in history. At the time, I loved it, but I loved my religion classes better. And I just felt them tugging at my heart. Now, it can work in the opposite way. A student at Campbell told me the other day that he felt God was calling him to help take care of the environment and asked me what I thought about that. And I said, go for it. God calls to these kinds of Ministries, these kind, this kind of service. He said, I genuinely feel the tug of the heart, not here sitting in a religion class, but helping care for the environment. And I thought it was a wonderful statement. 
So sometimes we are aware of the work of Christ in us and the needs of the world. So let me ask some of you tonight. What is it that tugs at your heart? Is there something tugging at your heart? Uh, a need? Is God calling you? God may not be calling you to give up your vocation or to move to another place, but he may be calling you to move a little bit. And I don't mean moving residents moving, but spiritually moving. God could be calling you to move some. And when you do that moving, it's amazing the blessings that come, which you don't think. When people deal with a God's call or with a call, there is sometimes this, this restlessness that's going on. Or sometimes it can be this just this tug of the heart, tugging of the heart. And I hope you'll come back to that and we have a chance to talk just a bit later. Here is another word, again, of what I alluded to earlier. Uh, sometimes God, while he calls in the present, there is this dynamic of our long-term memory. And things get stored in our long-term memory. And sometimes it takes a while for it to surface it takes it to a while for it to surface and for, for us to understand it. And thus, call is a very gradual process. And that may be true with a lot of you that, that you have found. Um, that all of, this, all of this was back there. All of this has been back there for a long time. It's been down deep in here for a long time. And it's just taken me a while to realize it. It's just very, very gradual, and that can happen. Responding to God's call usually invites confirmation from others. I've already alluded to that a little bit tonight, but I don't want to leave that out. Calling is communal. It's part of the body of Christ. And, you, and the good news about call is that confirmation will come. God brings confirmation to his calling. You preach a sermon, and there's nothing you'd rather do than do that. The pulpit is your home. You minister to people. You serve in a, in a teaching, in a, in a, as a teacher in a school. Uh, you serve someplace caring for children. That's your home. It's a home for you. And it invites confirmation from others. And people say things to you, won't they? Uh, I alluded humorously to the fact that people will say, I have seen this in you for a long time. That does happen. But they may say other things of how wonderful uh, that this ministry is. So, friends, characteristics of calling. Restlessness. If you ever hear that in somebody, it could be that a call is happening. Tugging of the heart. Just where, what is pulling and tugging the heart, what other people say, and what happens to you even in the midst of that. And again, let's all be reminded that God calls lay people as well as ministers. Lay people like Amos, who was quick to say, I am not a prophet nor son of the prophet. I don't, I don't belong over there. Or Ananias. Or Mary. God calls lay people. So laity, what is it that tugs at your heart? And how is God's call working in your life? These, friends, I think are some general characteristics of God's call. I want to show you just a couple of examples. And I know that you're studying these. And so I want to spend a lot of time. So many wonderful call experiences in the Bible. I want to lift up Samuel's to you. We could talk about Moses' call. I love Mary's call. When, when, when the angel Gabriel came to Mary and said, you are the chosen one, you're going to bear the, 
the holy child, the holy son, and, and the child, as the beautiful Christmas anthem says, that you will deliver will soon deliver you. But Mary needed more information. And that's what I love about the text. She had a few questions. It's okay to ask questions. How can this be? I don't have a husband, all this. And so she asked questions. Perfectly fine to ask questions. God calls lay people. The, the great stories of the lay people in the Bible. What I want to mention to you about Samuel, you know the story. Uh, don't, don't miss verse 1. Samuel's call came when the word of the Lord was rare. It was a terrible time. God calls in times like that. You'll notice uh, uh, what I wanted to uh, highlight here. Sometimes you have to be in places where God's call can be heard. I want to lift up the idea of places like restlessness and tug of the heart to you. Now, before you jump to the wrong conclusion, I know God can call anybody anywhere. Do you believe that? I do. But, Sometimes you have to be in a place where God's call can be heard. Where was Samuel when he heard God's call? In the temple. You can be in places where God, the environment is not conducive to hearing God's call. So I want to lift that up to you. Blessing on these young people here. They're in places where God's call can be heard. The other thing is this idea of mentors. Mentors. Who was Samuel's mentor? Eli. We, we need mentors when we're called. Samuel had an Eli. And so the invitation to you tonight is to be an Eli to a young Samuel or young Sarah who is being called. So I want to lift up that piece to you. Great. When you study the different call things, Samuel, place and mentors. Mary, it's okay to ask questions. And you begin to see these things. Now, uh, I know you've been studying that, but let me mention uh, Jesus. His is a little bit more difficult, isn't it? Or more spiritual, or, or uh, beyond explanation, the call of Jesus. Something happened to Jesus about age 30. He's working in the carpenter shop. Uh, we, apparently, Joseph died between the time Jesus was 12 and the time he was 30. We just, he's never mentioned again. Jesus, the image is he took over the carpenter shop. And then came the day he closed it and had to make his way to the Jordan. There is somewhere in the Gospels that invisible scene when Jesus tells his mother it's time for him to go. But the thing I want to uh, mention to you that is really important about uh, the call of Jesus is the uh, second bullet you see on the screen. It's not easy to talk about, and I make sure I talk about this with my students because I'm afraid other people won't. Call is sometimes bound up with economic risk. And there is an economic aspect to calling. It's amazing some of the young people, adults, answering God's call today. I have a class at 8 o'clock on Tuesday morning. I have all the first year Campbell Da Vinci School students, first semester students, because I believe the place to start in theological education is God's call. We don't throw anybody in the deep end of the pool. Some of you have been to seminary know what that's like. But they drive from Wilmington, Durham, Greensboro, all over the place. Some of you have done that. I did it. And get to class by 8 o'clock. Well, bullet number one, that, what got them out of bed was not the Dow Jones average that morning. What got them out of bed was a call. But they come from everywhere. Some of them have given up their jobs. They didn't know how they... You ought to hear some of these arrangements we hear. Uh, nurses who've worked out to uh, work part, uh, half a day on Saturday. 
uh, people who work at Walmart who've gotten their schedules changed so that they can work on the weekends, so they can come to class on Tuesday and Thursday. Some who've given up their job because the tug of the heart, tug of the heart was so powerful they had to do it. There is an economic aspect to calling. Now, the good news is that it tends to level out. It tends to level out. It's amazing how God provides. And I don't want to over-spiritualize that, but I believe it. God provides, does he? He does to his children. Um, and sometimes it may be less. Jesus ran a successful carpenter shop. He is referred to as the carpenter from Galilee. There's a non-biblical source that talks about uh, Jesus, the carpenter Jesus from Nazareth. He, had, he achieved some kind of fame. No doubt Joseph taught him his trade. But later he will say, the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus knew a little something about the change in economics because of answering God's call. That sometimes happens, and it's a real part. But it's amazing how God provides in all of that as well. So you can study each one of these. Samuel, place, mentors, Mary, okay to ask questions. Jesus, economics. And I could talk to you about the call of Paul and never mention the Damascus Road. Paul was a second career type person, as I mentioned, tent maker. And he had to experience that and change directions in the midst of all of that, as you know. Well, I, it's time for me to stop. The blessings of following God's call. And the last line there is the line I would like to give you. It is worth a life. It is worth a life to follow God's call. Young people here tonight, find out what's tugging at your heart, what God's calling you to do. It is worth a life to follow God's call. Well, thank you very much. Let me stop at this point and we'll make a transition. Thank you so much. Well, as you mentioned, we have been studying call on Wednesday nights. And this past Wednesday night, uh, some of those who were in that study wrote questions for you. Uh, and as I look at these questions, I think, you know, you have hit them to a point. But this will give us an opportunity maybe to flesh it out a little bit more. Uh, this first question comes from a parent. And it's, how do we teach our children to listen for God's call at a young age. And in parentheses, something as simple as being called uh, to be part of a church mission opportunity, kind of knowing by doing, like you mentioned yes. earlier. I think that's a great question, and uh, I, I would answer it in two ways. Number one, the stories, the stories in the Bible of calling, and pull out one thing from those stories, one or two things. Uh, from those, those stories. Uh, the second is the knowing by doing. I would expose, expose them to mission trips, to, uh, to, to different kinds of things that you think uh, should, should happen. But that's a great, great uh, opportunity of a parent to think about your children. And thinking about my, my job as a parent is not to make my children like me, but to to help them find what God has called them to be. What are their talents? If you, can, if you can discover one or two of those, find ways to start making that happen. And that consciousness, uh, it, it, will collect, it will gather and collect. So I think those are, those are great strategies. Uh, the call stories, knowing by doing, and your own thinking and praying. What what. What has God given this child? What can I, how can I help them uh, discover their talents and, and their calling? I, I think God, we, we should love the things we do. And what is it they love? What is it they love? So, 
Dupree, I, I would kind of go around with a lot of those, I think that would okay. be good. That sounds good. Um, so I pulled out several and lumped them together because I think they kind of um, speak to the same thing. So I'm just going to read them, okay? okay. And then good. we'll, we'll uh, go from there. Um, the entire infinity of God's will may not be able to humanly know or even understand. Do you have a recipe for remaining in the center of God's will and A, B, C, or one, two, three to follow? So this idea that if you're in God's will, then you'll know God's call. Um, how do I know God is calling me? Uh, how can I discern if I'm being called to service in the local church or on the foreign mission field? Um, and if, let's see, uh, d describe a process, and you've kind of done that in the general truths of calling. Yeah, yeah. yes, good. Well, that, that, those are great so questions. So how do you clarify it, I guess? Here, you know, there's the, the restlessness, the tug of the heart, you know, how, how do you clarify that? Well, what I would say is follow the light you have. Follow the light that is in front of you. Um, and it may be a mission trip. It may be um, a youth group. Uh, find, find one thing that you sense tugging at your heart uh, that you could follow. I think God reveals his will in chapters. We don't get the whole book. Um, and so what, what is the light that you have now? And it may be through that youth group or through that uh, peer group or BSU or whatever it might be uh, to follow. And then I do think there is this, this metaphor of doors that comes into play. I think it's a great metaphor of, of call, what doors are open to you now. Uh, God opens doors. Some doors don't open. Um, sometimes doors just fall automatically, unbelievably, right in front of us. We don't even have to think about it. So I think all those things come into play. If you can put some specifics, but uh, follow the light you have. It may be the choice of a school or the choice of a major. Uh, follow the light you have, and then I think of the other light will shine. All of you know that when you try to put a puzzle together, when you get the first piece, first few pieces done, it makes the rest of the puzzle easier to finish. And I think calling is that way as well. I hope that got at that a little bit. So uh, a follow-up to that, does our calling from God ever change? And how do you discern that? Yeah. yeah. Here, here's the way I, I deal with that. Call does not equal role, does not equal profession. Here's your calling to be a minister, to be a Christian, to be a teacher, whatever. But your roles may change. You may be an assistant teacher, you may be full-time teacher, you may be a youth minister, uh, and then you become a pastor. So the roles can change. And then profession may be the way you make your living. So I think, Dupree, is that um, roles change. But you can change roles and not abandon your calling. I've served as pastor of a church, and then I took a job teaching in a college. I didn't abandon my calling. calling. I just changed roles. Right? Just changed roles. And the same thing can happen in church. You might be teaching adults, but then you switch over and start teaching younger adults or something else. So you can change R-O-L-E-S without abandoning your calling. And that to me is very helpful. And I find it helpful also to make a distinction sometimes between call and profession. A lot of people feel called to things, but their job is not that calling. And sometimes a way to find peace with that is this is how I make my living. Uh, but this is my calling over here. I work in my church, I do this. But this is how I make my living. Now, if, if vocation 
your vocation is your calling, that's all the more wonderful. But don't beat yourself up if it's not. There's still a way to fulfill your calling. That help? I think that's, that's great. When you mention doors as well, I think, thinking about Paul, yeah. um, sometimes where we want to go, I mean, as a church planner, yes. and where God is yeah. calling us at the time with an open door, not the same thing. That's right. And you've got to be open. To and it. sometimes the door God opens uh, may not be the one he wants you to go through. There's a little verse. We, we miss a lot of stuff in the last chapters of the Bible. But in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 7 or 8, I don't have my Bible with me, but Paul's received this letter from Corinth. And they said, please come back. We need you to come back over here. And he says, no. A door has opened for me in Ephesus, and I'm going to stay here. And uh, so sometimes a door can open, but it's not the door you, you're supposed to go through. Now, that's tough, isn't it? But there's, there's biblical precedent for that. Uh, pastors, that little verse in 1 Corinthians 16. Yeah. So doors, uh, I think that's a wonderful, wonderful metaphor to help us call. And you mentioned uh, folk who are called and coming to Campbell Divinity School to uh, train, prepare for that call. Uh, this question, what does Campbell do to help students clarify their call to ministry? Yes, that's a great question. Uh, we start, uh, we, we tell them, just put yourself in our hands. <laughs> uh, we start. I the, tell these folk that too, but it's yeah, the life out of them. The first semester, the, the first part of their time there is dealing with God's call. Not only in class. But every student is in a precept group of four people. And those precept groups meet all through seminary. And some of them continue on through their ministry. And so with professors, both classroom and precept guidance, it is amazing how much clarity comes with some intentional work uh, with calling. So these are some of the things uh, that that we do and it's proven very helpful proven very helpful most youth ministers will become pastors uh, you cannot convince them of that to save your life <laughs> but they do uh, we, so we try to tell them that and help them with that but the key word there is being intentional about it, not expecting it to fall out of the sky. And, and we, we do that. And so a professor works with precept groups the whole time these students are here. And it is very helpful. And we're all the time talking about calling, clarifying calling. Okay. So uh, the next question is, when and how did you sense that God was calling you into the gospel ministry? Uh, I went to Mars Hill College, my college. Uh, I'm, I, I know I had stuff stored in my long-term memory, like being the pastor for Youth Week in my church uh, uh, several times. But uh, I was majoring in history, but uh, I was sitting in chapel, required chapel of all places, <laughs> seat Z3. And I w it wasn't very spiritual. Uh, my last name starts with a C. There was a young girl sitting in the B section that I really wanted to meet. <laughs> God that, works in strange and mysterious yeah, ways, doesn't he? And, and her name was Gail Brown. <laughs> but this May, uh, the two of us will uh, celebrate 48 years of being married. And so that's what I had my mind. But God spoke to me one day sitting in required chapel uh, to express my life as a minister. And it was part of the tug of the heart. I really love my religion classes better than I like studying history. I love history, but I love my religion classes. And I felt God put me there, led me there. I went to that school because my pastor put me in the back seat of his car one Saturday and took me there and said, this is where you need to go to college. And I did. And it changed my life. Changed my life. 
change my life. So that's how it worked for me. But I realized a lot of it was cumulative as well. All right. Um, so you, in your lecture, you said God calls all. Yes. Yeah. This question is, why is ordination important for those called to be deacons and pastors and not required for others who serve in the church? Yeah, Ordin uh, that's a great question. Call and ordination are two separate matters. Probably most students that I teach and see, maybe most of the people here, you have no problem at all doing what God's called you to do. I, don't, I like to believe I'll go wherever God calls me to go. But ordination is a different matter. Ordination is offering yourself to the life of the church. It is a, it is a day of dedication. You're, all, you're offering yourself to serve the church, largely institutional. Not always institutional, the church uh, at, at large. That's why there's ordination of deacons, to serve the church. So you can be called but you don't feel particularly uh, required to be ordained or to set apart to serve the church. Generally, it's true of Baptists, we prefer our ministers to be ordained. You probably wouldn't call a pastor who wasn't ordained. You prefer your church leaders to be. We, we prefer those serving communion or baptizing people. To be ordained. So ordination has as its history serving the church. So a young person who, who may answer God's call uh, and be happy about that, it, it's another matter to offer yourself to the life of the church. So that's where ordination fits in. Ordination has two meanings. One, to be set apart. You're set apart to be a pastor. But the other meaning, this is one I love the best. It means to feel your hands. To be ordained. Deacons, this applies to you, all, all of us as Christians. To be, to be ordained is to have your hands filled with the work God's called you to do. I love that. When I give an ordination sermon or ordination charge, that's the one I use. God, fill this person's hands and heart with the work you call to do. So I think it's uh, ordination is connected to the life of the local church. Institutional church. And does an affirmation of calling have something to do with that as well? Oh like yes. I was ordained at Bethesda Baptist Church in Clayton. I didn't have to get reordained in Franklinton and then in Roxborough no, because no. there was this understanding. No, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Now one of the things that I have noticed when I came along, which has been a while ago now, you, you were licensed for at least a year. Yes. Um, and then you were ordained usually when you had completed your seminary That's training right. and, and had a call to a church. That's right. Um, it seems that the licensing part is... All but disappeared. All but disappeared. Right. In the Baptist uh, world, it's all but disappeared. Part of the reason, I think, is the language has changed. When some of us here went to a seminary, the language was, you've been called to preach. Yeah. I'm going to seminary because I've been called to preach. The language has changed now to a call to ministry. So the license and peace uh, kind of faded with that. I think it's because the language changed. And... and um, so we don't think about it. We can still do it. License is kind of a sign of approval for a person to test out their gifts in the local church. We still have it. We just don't use it much anymore. Now, I want to say something to you to follow that up on it. Don't be uncomfortable about this. There's a strange dynamic that's working in theological education now. But I teach preaching at Campbell Divinity School, so I, I see it at work. Many students are called to preach after they come to divinity school now than before. Now, don't let that make you uncomfortable. The reason is they came to divinity school or seminary because of a call to ministry. And the last thing they think is, I'm going to be a preacher. 
And here's what happens. They have to take a required course called preaching. And they're trembling about it. And then they do it. Wait a minute. I love this. I love taking a parable and digging deep in that parable and then sharing it with the church. And I see it happening all the time. And so the the language changed and a little bit of the way preachers are called has changed, been changing a little bit too. So I think that's what happened to licensing. I think it faded in the background with the license change. That's my thought, Dupree. Right. Yeah. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about what you've seen with the change in missions as well with local mission trips yes. in churches? I know our church has really yes. grown in that area and this understanding of calling because it used to be you'd bring in a, a career missionary um, yes. you know, to speak. Yes. Yeah. It, we're getting back to the way Baptists did it in the beginning. It was called the society method. But and that was each local church did missions, and we're getting back to that now. Precious in the budget of Roxboro Baptist Church and Lambert Missionary Baptist Church, precious in the budget are your mission dollars. And you want control over those mission dollars. And so local churches are doing their own missions, uh, yeah. doing and we participate in missions global and local, but we found that we can do it. And so I think we're beginning to want a little more control over the money, where the money goes for missions. And so uh, part of that is doing missions ourselves. Now the great advantage of collective part is uh, uh, we, we can we can do together as many churches what no one of us can do alone. But I think we're getting back to the way Baptists did it in the beginning. Then Baptists got so large that we had centralized cooperative program and missions and uh, farm missions and home missions. But I think there's just been a new discovery of local churches doing their own missions. And I think part of it is local churches of kind of wanting to more control over their money. One last question, and it's not directly related to calling, but it is in a way. What do you think is the future for traditional churches like Roxboro Baptist? Hmm. Well, that, uh, who can see in a crystal ball our society and predict 10 years from now what the world will be like? Uh, the church, the church will always be here. Jesus, we know that. Jesus Promise. We know the church. Uh, what's different, and this question alludes to it, is when Ken Dupree and I and others of you came through the uh, seminary, the system, the great Baptist system was set. Uh, I'll, all I had to know was where to order literature from Nashville, when Lottie Moon Christmas offering and when Annie Armstrong was, and the system was there. I did not have to learn how to do church. But students coming in theological education now are having to struggle with how do you do church. And so some have come up with the answer, we need to have two services, a contemporary service and a traditional service. Or some say we have to have a blended service. So the question, the question uh, uh, of, of how we do church is certainly in front of us and what is going to happen uh, to traditional churches. There is a little bit of an uptick now in uh, membership in, in uh, traditional denominations like Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Episcopalian. Um, um, <clears throat> there are a lot of questions hard to predict. Uh, churches looking for pastors now won't I uh, will often have the expectation we need somebody that can get the 30 to 50 age group in church. Um, sometimes that expectation exists. Um, younger people are not taught to tithe like some of us were taught to tithe. 
and the old saw about 20% of the people give 80% of the budget, it's really down to about 10% now, about 10%. So I think the church will be here. It, it may not be in the same form that we have it now or that we see it now, but the church, the expression of Christ, the presence of Christ in the world uh, will be here. But I know what's behind that question, and it is, it is a concern. Uh, will, will traditional church, like you have known it, like I have known it, uh, be around? I think it will. I think it will. Uh, but maybe not quite in the same form that we've known it. But God is alive and he's still That's calling. right. Yeah. That's right. Thank you. That's, right. That's all our questions. May I ask one? It depends on who you ask go. it to, my friend. <laughs> no pressure. No pressure at all. Especially to the young people, if, if they feel like led to answer. What tugs at your heart? Anybody would like to give an answer to something that, about ministry, about church, faith, that just tugs at your heart? Would any of you, would any of you feel comfortable in answering? If, if you don't feel comfortable, don't. What, what's something out there that tugs at your heart? Making sure I keep God in the center of my life. I'm sorry, I didn't. Making sure I keep God in the center of my life. But, good, great. Wanting God to always be in the center of your life. Wonderful. Anyone else? Music. A love for sports. These things tug at these kids' hearts. What do they do with them? I know I love sports. How does God bring these back in the heart? It probably would be in a way, if you follow that, that you never imagined. You just never imagined. If you followed that and found a way to follow that, uh, it would have some kind of result like that, I, I would guess. Does that mean? Sounds like bacon frying to me. <laughs>this evening. Thank you for Dr. Cogdell, his life, for the many lives that he has touched and influenced. Lord, for the encouragement that we have received, we know that you love us. We are grateful that you call us. And Lord, our heart's desire is to be obedient to you in all that you call us to. Father, this world can get busy and sometimes we can be distracted. But we know that as your people, we are called to serve in your kingdom. And we pray that the talents, the spiritual gifts, those things that tug at our hearts, Lord, that you would use that and draw us to the ministry that you have called us to. And Lord, we will serve you and we will do it. Lord, with love and with gratitude for who you are and for what you have called us to. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a good evening. Thank you.